Good morning. Happy Father's Day again. <laughs> we are uh, we're glad that you're here. It's good to be here. We are we're talking about uh, worship. That's been our theme and our topic for for this month. And we have two more lessons in that. And uh, this morning we're going to be uh, talking on a. a kind of a, a touchy subject to, about worship and, and leadership, so we're going to be looking at some of Paul's writings and what he has to say on that, um, but we're going to be talking about the assembly, we're going to be talking about what we do here in, in worship as we devote or show our devotion to God on the first day of the week, this formal assembly that we have, and so a couple of things I wanted to kind of bring up as we are entering into this lesson, there are some uh, especially more recent Times there have been uh, some issues that have been brought up by different people in regards to the the gender of a person. I know I know we don't want to talk about news, but I mean that's kind of where we're going with this is this idea that there, you know, the terms like man and woman and and things like that have become offensive to some people. And, uh, you know, and, on Father's Day, we, we kind of zero in on the concept of fathers and the importance of fathers. And I thought that this would be, be fitting for us to talk about um, this morning, especially when we're talking about the assembly and talking about worship. But even those terms there, even the idea idea of family, the idea that we can call somebody father and call somebody mother has become offensive to some people, that these terms in the secular world have become an issue. And, and really not just in the secular world, but in the religious world, that many have begun to change their views on these things to kind of match the way culture is going and giving people opportunities to choose whether they were a man or a woman and, you know, in that kind of an idea. So there are some things in our culture that really have come to light that have conflicted with what the Bible teaches. And so these are things that we need to talk about. They're not always comfortable things to talk about, but they're things that we need uh, to talk about. They're touchy, uh, but we'll spend some time talking about it. I want you to think about this phrase as we enter into this lesson, because uh, I want to be very clear about where we're going with this. This phrase, equal value, is recognizing our unique role in the family. This, we're going to come back to this several times, but I want you to think about that. Equal value. Equal value. That's what we want. We want equal value. But sometimes, and most of the time, if not all the time, equal value is recognizing unique roles. Unique roles especially in the family. And often we think about equality, you know, we think about somebody having the exact position, right, in a family. We think, well, that's equality, you know, that equality is equal everything, that, you know, everybody dresses the same and looks the same and talks the same and has the same position, that that is equality. And we kind of use that as a standard to say, if we don't fit that model, then we're not practicing equality, that we are treating people wrong, that we are oppressing one group over over another, and that seems to be where our culture is leading, right? That if a, one person submits to another person, that the person who is submitting is of lesser value than the other person. But we know that's not true, right? I mean, that's, that's not how things work. That's not how things are. Just because a person submits to the authority of another person does not change that person's value at all that God sees that person in recognizing their submission, especially when he is the one that calls them to submission. We see Jesus as being submissive to his father, and we don't for a moment recognize him as being lesser than. We see his great value. In fact, his submission amplifies his great value, right? That that's how we see him. That's his example that he has left for us. So these are things that we need to think about when we talk about the church, when we talk about God's plan for the family as we move into Paul's writing. So if you want to open to 1 Timothy, we're going to be spending some time in 1 Timothy, uh, reading some things there. And Paul, to hit this letter to this young evangelist, uh, Timothy, you know, he gets the responsibility to, to go and to work with his church about these touchy subjects. And so Paul is instructing him 
on what to say and how things are to be and, and what God wants in his church, what Jesus is communicating through the Holy Spirit and how the church is to be organized. And so sometimes we look at 1 Timothy as the organization of the church because that's what Paul is telling this young evangelist. And so we're going to actually start in chapter 3 to help us build this and understand where, where this is going. But I, I believe this is very helpful, at least it is for me. So in chapter 3, we talk, we talk about church leadership. Who is going to have authority? Who's going to be the one who makes tough decisions? Who's the one who is going to hold fast the truth? You know, who are we going to go to for leadership? Because we all know that leadership is necessary. That regardless of what group you're in, there has to be some in the group that have more knowledge, that have more maturity, that can lead the rest, that this is part of any group that you are involved in. We recognize that. And the church is no different. The church needs strong leadership. Who will lead the church? Well, the church is not left to guess on that, right? We are not left to make that choice on our own. We are given by God an example of what kind of leadership the church needs to have. And so Paul tells Timothy to look for certain men to serve in this position. The Bible calls them elders. The Bible calls them shepherds. The Bible calls them overseers. They're pastors. They are those who will shepherd the flock of God. And so look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. Hey, Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, then again, that's another term, elders, pastors, de uh, not deacons, but elders, pastors, overseers. It is a fine work to desire to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. So if the elder, here's, not really a trick question, but, you know, just from the text, if the elder is to be the husband of one wife, is this person a man or a woman? What do you think? Nobody wants to answer that question? <laughs> it's not a trick question. All right, so if, if the elder is to be the husband of one wife, is this, is this a man or a woman? It's a man, right? But, you know, when we start messing with terms, we've got a problem, don't we? So the secular world wants to mess around with terms, the Bible doesn't mess around with terms. This is the husband of one wife. So we already know what we're talking about. We're looking for men in the congregation. He's already said that. But it's more apparent when we say that this is the husband of one wife. That's who we're looking for. Some men in the congregation who can serve as, as elders. And then he says in verse 3, he says, not addicted to wine, pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So the husband in general, has a unique role in his household. That's expected in the text, right? And that's not the topic, but it is certainly a qualification of this man, if we want to use that terminology. So we look to these men and we recognize in their own household, how have they managed their family? Have they taken the God-given role of head of the house? And have they taken it with honor and humility and respect? Have they actually served in that capacity? Because that's the kind of man that God wants to serve in his church. Is this what we see in a person? In fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. So not only husbands faithful to wives, wives faithful to husbands. Verse 23, be subject to your husbands, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Now, go and read Ephesians chapter 5. There's more to that, but I just wanted to, to kind of bring that up, that this is something that was expected, that the husband was to be head of this family, and when Timothy was told to go find men to serve as elders, that is what he's looking for, somebody who has taken this role seriously, who has taken this role seriously and has served this purpose. That's what we look for when we look for men to serve. So before he can, before a man, because evidently that's what we're talking about, right? Before a man can serve in the role of overseer, he must, there must be evidence 
that he is serving his family well. Right? That's what Paul's telling Timothy, that there has to be evidence that he's serving his family well before he can serve in the church and the capacity of leadership as somebody who serves as an elder, as an overseer, right? He, he needs to have taken hold of the God-given role of head of the house. He has managed his household well. And, and if a father, the point is, right, in kind of brackets there to say, if, if the father hasn't taken on God's given role of head of the house, how is that person expected to have authority in the church, have a position of leadership in the church, right? If he can't take care of his own family, how is he going to take care of the family of God? That's, that point should be clear. Verse 6, he says, And not a new convert, so that he will not become uh, conceited and fall into the con condemnation incurred by the devil. You know, the devil... The adversary, the enemy, right, is looking for any opportunity, any opportunity that he can possibly find to leverage disorder, disunity, pride, selfish ambition. He wants to leverage these things so that he can divide the family. Right? He wants to pit the family against each other. He wants the wife to want to take the position of the husband, and he wants the husband to want to take the position of the wife. I don't know if that always goes that way all the time, but that, you know, they, they're, they're battling against each other. He wants them to fight each other for positions of authority. And that's how the world is, isn't it? We're always fighting for positions of authority. But Jesus identifies authority different than the world does. He doesn't say authority is, is having ultimate power and control over everybody and, and standing up above everybody and taking the best seat at the, the banquet and, and lording everybody over everybody, but authority, leadership, is humbling yourself, isn't it? It's humbling yourself. And if you were here to listen to Brother Leslie Boone on Wednesday, it's washing the feet of disciples. That leadership looks like servanthood. That leadership is humble. That leadership is submissive to the authority of the king. That leadership looks like service, right? And when we see this in the way the Bible is presenting it in Jesus, that we recognize that this idea of a wife submitting to her husband is not so that the husband can lord over her and have power and control. That's how some people see this. But that's not how God wants it. But there has to be a recognition in roles, right? There has to be a point where you stop and say, that's a man, and he's a husband, and that's a woman, and she's a wife, and they have positions in the family, and battling against each other for power is going to separate the family, and that's what God wants. It's the same in the church, isn't it? The church family, when the church fights in battles for positions of authority, guess what's going to happen to that church? It's going to fall apart. It's going to break. It's going to be destroyed. And the devil wants to do that, right? And that's what Paul's pointing out, that a new convert is going to be subject to temptations that will lead to this, divisions, power, hungry, pride. Those things that a mature Christian has put away from their life is going to destroy the family of God if that person is put into power. There are other things that we can add to that list we're talking about dividing the family by not taking on the roles that God has given us to take on. A, a man who is a faithful husband, a faithful father, a faithful Christian will be mature enough, will have enough experience needed to serve in the church. And that's what Timothy is looking for. Look at verse 7. And, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church. So not just like putting on a show inside the church, obviously, right? Or just putting on a show in his family so that everybody can kind of see who he is. But, but all everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes, he has a good reputation so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We have to consider all of these things. All of these things. So here are a few things that I want you to think about before we get to chapter 2. That's our, our tricky text. But a few things I want you to think about. First off, this is not Paul's opinion. <laughs> Some people like to say, well, you know, Paul was just saying it, and he's Paul, and that's what he thinks. This is not Paul's opinion. This is not a cultural thing for Paul. 
But this is God's instruction to the church. This is Jesus' instruction to his church through the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Paul. This is God's message. This is how God wants his church organized. This is how God wants things to be with the husband, the father, a mature Christian serving as leaders in the church. And number two, number two, this does not place more value on elders, on men than women. Can we see that? Can we acknowledge that? That that's not what Paul's point is. That's not what this is all about. It's not placing more value over one over the other. It's not saying, well, these men have greater value than all the rest of you. That's not it at all. And it's not saying that men have greater value than women. That, we know that's not true, right? And that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that God has given each of us roles to, to hold up and to respect and to honor and to live out. And Paul says, you look for men who are, who are holding that up. You look for men who are serving in that capacity. You look for men who are serving in their God-given role because that is what I have instructed them to do. And those are the kind of men who I want serving in my church. So then again, we come back to our, our phrase, equal value is recognizing our unique role in the family. 1 Timothy 2. This is where it gets a little dicey, but we'll talk about this. 1 Timothy 2. This has become a source of a lot of division and conflict in the church, especially over the years. So I want to approach this text with a couple more ideas. <laughs> Just kind of preface this a little bit. Okay, so Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 2, should not be seen as oppressive to women, but convicting to men. We should think about that for a minute. The point that he's making is not to oppress women. It's not to say that they're of lesser value. It's not to put them in their place, even though there may have been some issues in this. We don't know. And Paul may be correcting some things, but the point is to be very convicting. That's how I want us to read this. This is very convicting to men. Very convicting. Men, these passages, these, these things we're about to read should cause us to pause and to think about our role in the family should cause us to pause and think about our role in the church. That fathers, right, that we, we should read Paul's words with humility, with a heavy weight of responsibility that God has given fathers to lead the family in a Christ-like example, that we should be not asking the question, why can't women lead in the church, which is always the question people ask. The question we need to be asking is, why are not men stepping up to the role of leadership and serving in the church that God has directed them? Those are the questions we need to be asking. This needs to be convicting to us as men and as fathers. So look at verse 8, chapter 2. He says, Therefore I want men everywhere to play, uh, every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So Paul's context in, in, in this text is prayer. That's going to be a main thrust, the idea of prayer. What does a church do? The church prays, right? And if you look at verses 1 and 2, he'll tell you what we're supposed to be praying for. So men are to pray in behalf of the church. What do we pray for? For all right? All, that, that's the big phrase, right? You pray for all. And then he says, um, well, first of all, then I urge you, uh, the entreaties and prayers, petitions, thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings, all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So our worship, we've been talking about worship this month, our worship our devotion to God is seen in how we pray for the world around us. We love to pray for each other, and we do that all the time, but how often do we pray for the world around us? Remember, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, right? The Lord's Prayer, we call it sometimes the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And one of the things that Jesus says about this is, as you're praying, Father... Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, we need to adopt this prayer, okay? We need to adopt this prayer. We need to be praying. The men need to be praying for the church in behalf of the church. The men need to be praying that God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, that God's kingdom, God's rule and reign be exercised here on earth 
as it is in heaven. If we pray for our kings and we pray for our presidents and we pray for our leaders that they take on the responsibility of leadership by adopting God's version of right and wrong and good and bad, and that that's what we need to pray for. That God's kingdom come here on earth, that his rule and reign be exercised by leaders all around us. We pray for the leaders of our community. We pray for the leaders of our nations, that they will be like our God in their judgments, right? That's what we need to pray for. And Paul is noticing this around him, but he's saying that, that men, right, are to lift up holy hands in prayer, that we are to lift up our hands. And this is not a position, right? It's not, not that we all have to lift our hands up in order to pray or we're not fulfilling, you know, Paul's command here. That's not the point. The idea of lifting up holy hands is lifting up hands that are not soiled with disorder and arguing and anger and dissension and all the things that cause division, Right? That these men who are praying are to pray for the people around us, the nations around us, in such a way, and when they come forward, we recognize them as men who lift up holy hands. They don't have soiled hands. That's not going to distract us. Right? We're not going to see them as people who are full of hatred and disorder and ungodliness. Right? Because Paul wants us to live tranquil lives. And this role of prayer in the church is so vitally important to the church. So Paul is stressing that these men lead in prayer in the assembly, right? And that they are not to be a distraction due to their personal conduct. So these men will serve in that capacity. Now verse 9. Verse 9, he starts talking to women. And then again, there might be an issue here. We don't really know. Paul doesn't really go into much detail about what's going on here. But in verse 9, he says, like, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Now, we get wrapped up in the, the attire part, right? The clothing, the braided hair, all this stuff like that. Paul's point is that when women adorn themselves, how are they supposed to adorn themselves? What are they to put on? What, what will be the thing that they're noticed most for? It's not supposed to be their clothing, right? And he, then again, he's not restricting women on clothing. That's not the point. The point is, though, when people see you and people know you, and they know you in the community, and they know you in the church, and they know you in the family, what are they going to think about you? Are they only going to think, man, that, that, you know, they dress up nicely, you know? I mean, they, that's it. They look, they, all, every time, it's all I want to do is see them dress up, you know? I mean, is that their focus? Or what is Paul saying here? What do they dress up in? Good works, right? Put those on. You know, put on good works, right, that is proper for someone who is claiming godliness. As a Christian, in this men and women alike, we need to be known as people who do good, who serve, who love, who have compassion. And that's the kind of thing we need people to recognize. Not our clothes, right? But who we are in our service to God. And Paul is telling women, this is what you need to be focusing on. If you want someone to acknowledge you and look at you, that's what they need to look at. That's what they need to focus on. Those are the things that you need to be seen for. Verse 11, he says, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow women to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. Now, then again, it's not Paul's opinion. I know sometimes people like to insert that in there. These are Paul's words as the apostle. This is inspired writing that Paul is instructing women to do these things. And then again, I don't think he's left the context of the assembly. Right? So a woman's role, a woman's role, a woman is to learn in quietness and full submission. Right? Quietness and full submission. The issue is one of authority and position in God's plan. That seems to be the issue. Listen, learn, right? And, and then again, we think about the culture and how things have always been, and it has not always been free for women to learn, has it? It's not always been free for women to have rights. It has not always been free for women, even in the culture in Paul's day, that, that women's rights were not always good, that they were limited, that there were things that they couldn't do and things that they wouldn't do. And 
the gospel. The gospel has opened up for men and women alike these, these beautiful positions in the family, in the church, that has opened up the ability for us to, to be in a society where we can all learn and we can all have a say and we can all live out our salvation in peace and tranquility. And so Paul is not being oppressive. He's just pointing out the fact that these things need to be this way, that this is how things are, that when you're talking about leadership, the men are, have a responsibility to stand up and take that role, take that position. What does it look like in singing? Yes, in singing. And when you're talking about prayer, yes, in prayer. Right? They are to lead the assembly in prayer. They are to lead in teaching and preaching. They are to lead in authority as elders and shepherds in the church. And the women have this position. And Paul is telling them this is the way things are to be. It's not about somebody being more, having more value than somebody else. And again, that's not the point, is it? It's not saying, well, men have more value than women. No. That's not Paul's point. He's just simply saying that different people, men and women, and even men on different stages of maturity have different roles to play. So think about this phrase again. Equal value is recognizing our unique role in the family. Now think about women teaching. I mean, how, do women teach? Do women teach? Do women, do you, do you all teach? Are you all involved in teaching? Absolutely, right? Y'all you you teach our kids. You teach you teach in many different forms, in many different fashions. You teach through your life and through your submissiveness. Is that teaching? Can we say that being submissive is a form of teaching? Jesus taught that way. Jesus humbled himself. That was a wonderful lesson that we learned from Jesus. Is it possible that a, that a woman can teach a man? Absolutely. We have examples of that in Scripture. We have Priscilla and Aquila and Timothy himself is a product of his mother and his grandmother, that women hold a beautiful role in building up and educating and teaching the gospel to people. Paul is saying that when you're in an assembly, though, when you're together like this, when you're here, that I want men to stand up and take that role. That's what he's saying. And then women have, have that role of learning and growing and maturing in Jesus. But look what Paul says. He gives us a reason. He kind of explains, okay, now, some of them, even that day, right? I mean, even in that day and time, might be looking at Paul and say, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't like it, you know? And, and Paul says, okay, let's, let's go back and see how God has established this. What, what has God done over time? Is there something in the past that is going to give us an indication of how things are to be in the present? And Paul would say, yes, look at verse 13. He says, for it was Adam who was first created. And we can kind of stop there for a minute. And then Eve, right? So Paul is pointing out that in the order of creation that Adam was created and then Eve. So he points that out as, as an order of creation. Verse 14. He says, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in the faith and love and sanctity and self-restraint. All right, so here, let's break this down a little bit. So men were created first, but that doesn't put more value on men than women, okay? That's not how that works, but that's Paul's point. He says, in the creation, you know that Adam was created first. Adam was created first, and then Eve was created after Adam, right? And we also know this from the story of creation, that it was Eve who was deceived in the garden. Now, this is an important part of Paul's argument, very important part. We might skip by it if we're not careful. But Eve was the one who was deceived in the garden. She abandoned her role, right, of, of submissiveness to her husband. And what did she do? She followed the words of the devil, and she went and took what she wanted already of the fruit. And then what did she do with it? What did she do with the fruit? She gave it to her husband, right? Who knew better, right? And so she was deceived, but man stepped right into this thing, wide, eyes wide open, right? I mean, we knew what was going on. Adam knew what was going on. He stepped right into it. He knew that was wrong. He knew he wasn't supposed to do that. He knew the words of God. He should have been the one to step up and say, whoa, hey, let's not do this, right? I mean, that is his role after all. 
He should have stopped everything and said, you're being deceived. You're being lied to. Don't go there. But what does he do? He takes the fruit and he eats it. The role of the family has suddenly been reversed, right? The woman has taken the lead in the, in the narrative. She's taken the lead and she's leading her husband in this direction. And the husband doesn't stop as the head of the family and put his paws on things, right? And say, no, no, don't do this. He willingly walks into this. So they're both at fault, right? We know that, that Adam and Eve were both at fault in the fall of the garden. But what we're seeing here is the roles being reversed, right? The roles are being reversed. Women take on the lead and man follows, right? And both Adam and Eve are, are leaving their God-given roles. They're both leaving the position that God has put them in. And the point is, is not that women, I don't believe this is the point of Paul, that women are being punished for Eve's sin. I don't really think that's Paul's point, although that's part of the curse, right? I mean, there's some indication in the curse that, that as a result of all of this, there were certain things that would happen, and we, we know that. But I don't think Paul is saying, well, you women can't lead because you're being punished for Eve, I don't think that's his point at all. But I do think that Paul's point is that when you see the roles that God has given to men and women reversed, and women take the lead, and men become, well, I don't even want to call that submissive. It's really just blindly stepping into it, right? Bad things happen. That this is not how God designed things. This is not the purpose. This is not how things ought to be. And here's an example in the Old Testament, all the way at the beginning of these roles being mixed up. And it has caused worldly catastrophic disorder. Right? And he's saying that don't do this. Don't follow that pattern that is laid out for us in Old Testament history. Don't go down that road again. Guess who really wants us to go down that road? Who, who do you think really wants us to take that path? The same person who wanted us to take that path in the beginning, right? When, when the serpent in the garden was, was deceiving Eve, he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was disrupting the family. He knew that he was changing the order. He knew that he was going to be able to deceive Eve and that Adam would follow after his wife, right? And it's the same devil, it's the same serpent that's trying to get us today to change the roles and change the positions and change everything instead of taking on our God-given role, right? So, as Christian men, then again, we need to zero in on this, this responsibility that men have. This is not designed to be oppressive to women, but this is designed to be convicting to men. Where are the men, right? That's the point. Where was Adam? Where are we? Where are we in this story? And the questions we have to ask ourselves are, am I serving the church well by teaching and leading the church in prayer? Right? It, the question is not, you know, why can't women lead in the church? You know, why don't women step up and lead? No, no. The question is, why are men not stepping up? Right? Why am I not stepping up? Why am I not serving and leading and teaching the church and leading the church in prayer. Those are the questions we need to ask. And for husbands, we have questions like this. Am I a husband of one wife? That's a question that we get from chapter 3, isn't it? Am I devoted to one woman? Am I committed to one woman? Am I a one-woman man? Is that, is that my focus? Am I devoted and faithful to my wife? Am I taking the role of head of the house and head of the wife with love and compassion and the humility that Jesus took and that we take towards Jesus and his church, am I taking that responsibility seriously? And for fathers, am I showing a Christ-like example by managing my household well? Am I encouraging my children to be obedient and faithful to me? so that they will learn to be obedient and faithful to our Father when they leave my house? Am I teaching them the ways of God, the kingdom ways? Am I teaching them to be submissive to King Jesus so that when they leave my home, that they have, through faithfulness through me, learned how to be faithful to the Father and serve their family and lead their family in the same way that God has 
told me to lead my family, right? Am I doing that? Is that what I'm taking on? Is that the position that I'm holding? Then again, we shouldn't be asking about the leadership position in the assembly. That distracts us from the point that Paul wants us to see that men need to step up. They need to pray and lift up holy hands that we need to take on the role that we are given. So here's how we conclude this. Both men and women, both men and women alike are equal in value. Don't we see that from the gospel? Doesn't the gospel teach us that? That when we were baptized into Jesus, that there's no distinction between man and woman, Jew, Gentile, barbarian, slave. <laughs> it doesn't matter that those positions, whatever we are, whoever we are, does not define how valuable we are. Do we see that? Somehow we think it doesn't work that way. Somehow we think that if I'm submissive to somebody, I have less value. That if I'm submissive to the elders, pff, I'm just a footstool. I have less value, right? Because that's what the world teaches us. The gospel doesn't teach us that at all. The gospel doesn't teach us that. The gospel teaches us that when we take on these roles with seriousness and compassion and love and humility, that in our Father's eyes, we have great value. But when we confuse these roles and we mess them all up and we distort them and change them, that's when our value goes down. You want to value women? Encourage them to serve Encourage them to submit to their husbands. Encourage them to be what God has designed them to be. Women, if you want men to have value, encourage them to step up to the God-given leadership roles that they're given. Encourage them to be head of the house. Encourage them to do the things that God wants them to do because that's where the value lies. Right? Not in equality. Not in equality. But our value lies in taking on our God-given roles. What keeps us from doing that is pride. It's the same thing in the garden, wasn't it? Same issues we see back then, the same strife, the same disorder that Satan is trying to plant the seed of. It hasn't changed any. Pride gets in the way. So let's think about this phrase as we close this, this morning. Don't allow pride to get in the way of your devotion to God. Don't allow pride to get in the way of your devotion to God. Women, mothers, grandmothers, dads, men, husbands, don't allow pride to get in the way of your devotion to God. If there's anybody here this morning who is needing to put on Jesus and become part of the family of God, where we are equal at the cross. If there's anybody here who needs to put on Jesus in baptism, or if there is anybody who needs the prayers of this congregation, please come forward and, as we stand and as we sing.